Well, good afternoon and welcome to our third town hall meeting for St. Mary's County Public Schools where we are discussing what the fall is going to look like, the fall 2020 safe return to school for St. Mary's County Public Schools. Um, for those who haven't tuned into previous town hall meetings, um, we had one in June and earlier in July and we also had a board meeting last week where we discussed in detail our recovery plan and where we were overall with the process. As a way of reviewing, um, our planning is all predicated on the larger agencies who coordinate and oversee uh, schools and school systems in St. Mary, Mary's County and across the state of Maryland. Uh, the first is we predicate our work on the governor, Governor Hogan's Maryland Strong Roadmap to Recovery Plan that was put forth in uh, late April and May as we entered the second or third month of the pandemic. At the same time, the Maryland Together Recovery Plan for the Maryland State Department of Education was introduced and drafted throughout May and ultimately published in June. Both the Maryland Strong and the Maryland Together plans have been updated as new information and data becomes available. The Maryland Together plan specifically was updated in the earlier part of this month and as we discussed I think at the board meeting and in previous meetings their decision matrix has been modified slightly. Either way all of our work can be found on the St. Mary's County Public Schools website www.smcps.org when you go to that website when you go to our website at the very middle of it you're going to see a, a little image of a bus and it'll say recovery planning and that takes you to a web page that has a whole host of information including the previous two town hall meetings and the most recent board of ed where we discuss specifically the recovery plan also included on there is a survey and an opportunity to ask questions and to submit questions as well as uh, supporting documents such as the PowerPoint and the overall plan by the end of this week we will have the complete plan for St. Mary's County Public Schools published and ready to go and that will be aligned to what the state the Maryland State Department of Education requires of each county to have posted by uh, August 14th our next board meeting on August 12th we will also be going over the plan and adding more details in fact that will be the primary focus of that board meeting answering questions that people may have all of our work as we have started and worked all the way through we have six guiding principles first and foremost in any decisions that we make the health and safety of our students and our staff who are supporting our students is our primary concern and that really is what drives decisions after health and safety it's equity and access whatever we do for one we have to be able to do for all and we must be as consistent as we possibly can recognizing that education is a fundamental right of all of the students in st mary's county Health and safety, equity and access, how do we communicate that with our stakeholders and our students and our parents and our community? That's communication and engagement and that really is why we are doing what we are doing today with the town hall, what we've done with the previous town halls, what we've done with board meetings, what we've done with phone outs and things such as that. In fact, um, parents, you are going to be receiving a letter later today with a summary of a great deal of this information and links to a whole host of information. Engaging in high quality instruction, that's going to be the second half of our presentation today. You're going to see a preview of the Schoology platform that we have had incredible educators working on in earnest since April, May, and June, and into the month of July. They're finalizing their products, so when our teachers come back, our teachers will be able to um, really utilize that platform. That ties into the fifth, technology and resource support. Um, my gosh, I have to tell you that uh, the technological lift to be able to do something like this is uh, pretty extreme. Um, certainly it requires a real shift from in-person instruction to virtual instruction and we made that shift in a, and again, not to throw out jargons and terms, but we used Edgenuity in the, in the spring and that was a asynchronous platform which means that kids could get on and plow through that work and they could work whenever was most convenient for them they might work at 1 in the morning they might work at 8 a.m. well they probably weren't working at 8 a.m. but they could work whenever they wanted to it was asynchronous they could progress they could follow their progress through 
teachers could then remote in and see how kids were doing at a time that was most convenient and conducive to their schedules. That was the, that was the technology that we put in place in the spring. That is not the technology that we are rolling out the 2020, 2021 school year with. That is not the Schoology platform, and we're gonna have a lot more detail about that from Ms. Heather Wasikinski later in today's town hall. And the last really goes back to the first, Health and Safety and Equity and Access, it's meeting the diverse needs of students. Students come to St. Mary's County Public Schools with many needs and they are all individually tailored to the experiences of that particular child. And the plan that we put forth really has to take into account each individual child and put forth a plan that best keeps all engaged and safe, but also meets their very diverse set of needs. All of the plans and all of, the, all of our effort, we have six things that have held constant. Our staff in the buildings and as st more staff's introduced and ultimately as students are introduced. Six things, hand washing, hand sanitizer, face coverings, physical distancing, routine and systemic cleaning, and then training for all staff from everything from our littlest learners to how you wash your hands to advanced uh, cleaning resources that we have for our building service workers as they move through spaces between transition times with staff. Those six principal parts of our plan are gonna be seen throughout all of our work. Last week when we had the Board of Education and we were talking about our plan, we said at the end of it, we are not going to finalize anything today. We give as much information as we possibly could have, but we were not gonna finalize anything today because we were still waiting on information and direction from the perhaps the governor and certainly from the Maryland State Department of Education. And we knew that there was going to be a formal press conference later that same day, Wednesday, July 22nd. We all waited in anticipation for this and the concrete guidance that would be provided um, what we did receive was um, some messaging that was a little different than we had heard before. And the direction from the Maryland State Department of Education, the best that we could really extract from it is that the state superintendent made this statement. And it reads like this, if you didn't hear it. Now with the state firmly in recovery, local school systems have the flexibility to determine in consultation with their local health officers, how they will open and which groups of students and staff will be able to re-enter buildings. The state superintendent provided this guidance on July 22nd. That leaves a great deal of responsibility in every single local school system. We take that responsibility absolutely to heart. What makes St. Mary's County better than any other county in the state of Maryland is our incredible relationship that we particularly have with our local health office, our local health department. And in fact, today we are joined by Dr. Mina Brewster, who is the health officer and who leads the health department for St. Mary's County Public, pardon me, not St. Mary's County Public Schools, St. Mary's County. And we thought it's only appropriate that at this point we're going to transition to Dr. Brewster to talk a little bit about how St. Mary's County COVID response is going and the data points that we all track to make informed decisions. And so with this, I'm gonna to transition to Dr. Mina Brewster. Dr. Brewster. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much, uh, sure. Superintendent Smith, uh, for the time to speak here today. Um, as you mentioned, uh, I'll describe some of the data points uh, that, are, that we're monitoring here locally related to the pandemic. Uh, but first, I really want to acknowledge all the collective efforts of our community partners, uh, including our local school system, which has been tremendous, uh, and all the work uh, that has been done uh, recently to respond to this pandemic and prepare for what's ahead. Uh, it's really been an unprecedented five months uh, and uh, for our county, and I know it's been exhausting not just for our community partners, uh, but certainly also for our businesses and of course our families. Uh, it seems like we still have a long way to go with this pandemic uh, and uh, we are learning new things about this uh, disease every day. So I really encourage everyone to stay informed and be tuned into what's going on here locally. Our uh, St. Mary's County Health Department uh, maintains a very informative website uh, with COVID-19 information and local updates, data, testing information, and public health guidance. 
Uh, that's available at www.smchd.org. There's a big red coronavirus button on the front page uh, that you can click to take you to all that information. All of the information and data that I will be showing here today uh, also uh, is available on our website uh, at that uh, www.smchd.org uh, page. Uh, we also have partnered with county government uh, to offer a local COVID-19 hotline, uh, and that's available at 301-475-4911. It's available Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. There are language translation services available as well. Our health department also has Facebook and Twitter sites where we do post important information for our community. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about the data specifically uh, that uh, I thought we'd I wanna highlight uh, for today. So last week, we launched a new interactive data dashboard on our smchd.org website. It includes the data points I'll talk about, uh, as well as some others. So far, we have tested 11% of residents in St. Mary's County for COVID-19. There are many testing sites available in our county, um, including the appointment-free, order-free testing sites offered by our health department at the locations and times listed here on this slide. Uh, more information on these sites and other testing availability is at our smchd.org website. Uh, we're also monitoring a seven-day rolling average of the number of positive tests we have had relative to the number of residents tested in the same time period. This is a little bit different than the positivity rate that the state health department calculates for each county. The state calculation of positivity rate only looks at the number of positive tests relative to the total number of tests. Since some people have uh, had uh, tests done multiple times, uh, particularly to know if they're uh, clearing the virus, um, the state calculated number really may not be the best assessment of positivity for our jurisdiction. Um, so that's why we here locally clean up our data uh, locally to make sure that there are no duplicates and we calculate it as I described uh, based on the number of residents being tested. So our value here locally uh, is about 4.7% uh, as of yesterday. You can see that we have been swinging up over the past handful of days uh, in that uh, positivity. We have had nearly 890 cases of COVID-19 in St. Mary's County residents diagnosed thus far. Uh, we've had positive cases in all the age groups listed here uh, on the slide, including children less than the age of 20. In fact, over the past couple months, about a quarter of our positive tests have been in that zero to 19 age group. With this illness, we're seeing the worst disease uh, in those who are older, primarily uh, in their 60s and above. Um, older individuals and those with chronic medical conditions like diabetes are at greatest risk for COVID-19 uh, related fatalities. Uh, this slide here illustrates the number of COVID related uh, fatalities in St. Mary's County residents across different age groups. About two thirds of our St. Mary's County resident fatalities have been in residents of long, uh, local long-term care facilities. I want to note uh, that what I've just presented and what is available publicly on our website are just some of the data points that we're monitoring here locally. Uh, we are also monitoring statewide metrics as well as the national picture of this pandemic because we're not isolated here in St. Mary's. What's happening around us is very relevant to what may happen to us. And in addition, the science of this disease is evolving rapidly. So we tune into all of this both that science, the emerging science, as well as the collective data, the local, state, and national data, guide our public health decision-making at the local and state levels. So thank you, Superintendent, for the time to speak. Absolutely. Again, I know it's been a tough several months. Um, there's a long road ahead, so I'm encouraging everyone to stay informed, make smart decisions, and keep heart. Absolutely. Well, and thank you very much. And, and the one thing that we really want to reinforce to people who are watching, to parents, to, 
students to to staff members to the larger community um, the school system does not make it does not make decisions in isolation we bring in our community partners and we really do have data that drives our decisions um, because we don't take the decisions that we make lightly certainly and you would expect nothing less so with, with that, and thank you very much, Dr. Brewster, for joining us, and, and we're actually going to be calling on Dr. Brewster to come and, and, and present as we move through further phases of our return to school. Um, where we are right now is that we have staff returning to the work site. Keep in mind that we had s some staff never has never left, all right? There are 12-month staff members that have been since the very first day that we went out. Um, one of them is in this room with me right now, and you'll see her a little later when we do questions and answering. Dr. Maury Montgomery, the Deputy Superintendent of Schools, um, has been in the office pretty much nonstop since we, since we started. Um, we brought staff back. We brought back staff. Well, we had food service staff that, that came back in that, in that very first week and worked continuously to make sure that we were providing food to our most at-risk students and then ultimately providing food to anybody, any child under the age of 18 in St. Mary's County. In May, we had many staff come back to make sure that we had a, a commencement ceremony fitting to the wonderful uh, accomplishments of our class of 2020. We had representatives from safety and security and maintenance and operations and administration and teachers all coming out to make sure that that, was, that, that actually happened and we were able to deliver that for our kids. In the month of June, we brought back 12-month um, staff and teachers and 11-month staff to close out the school year, to clean out classrooms, to distribute materials back to students. In the month of July, July, we've had staff come back, all the 12 month staff is back and we're operating in buildings and in central office and we're on a modified work schedule as we usually follow in the summer, a four day work week and we've been affording some elements of telework for those who are most appropriate for this month. All of this has been done with the following guidelines to keep our, state, our staff safe. Social distancing, maintaining six feet of separation, wearing face, clo face cloth, uh, cloth face coverings when entering and leaving buildings and one, one unable to socially distance or in a shared workspace with others, um, making sure that we have the ability to wash our hands and have hand sanitizer and have wipes and sprays and things such as that so that we wipe down shared surfaces when we are in the school building and shared materials. Um, and then the last is a, a really robust reporting system where all staff have been required to report to human resources if they have a positive case of COVID. And that reporting goes for whether they were on site or off site, just so we can keep track of staff who are going through that process and making sure that we can maintain and see how they are doing throughout that process. So again, the staff return timeline for this year, July 1, throughout this month, we've had 12 month staff reporting to the work site. For those staff that telework is an option, they've been able to exercise that telework option for this month alone. Uh, next week in August, 11 month staff report to work. There is a great deal of work that needs to happen at each one of our work sites to prepare for offering a virtual instruction and for gathering the materials together and putting together a distribution plan and timeline to get those materials out to students and parents and the community. On August 24th, that is our official start date for teachers. And so that, was, that will be when we have our teachers coming back into the building, without children, coming back into the building to prepare for a virtual start with all of our children the following week. Now, please know that for all staff, there are Families First Coronavirus Relief Act that's available for people that have any of the, any of the qualifications that would then entitle them to that leave. Americans with Disability, ADA, workplace accommodations are also being provided for any staff that has a medically diagnosed issue that may impact their ability to come back and work in a traditional classroom setting. Um, the last is that we've had a child care work group to talk about how we can support our staff who have students at home, who have children at home. All of that work is ongoing um, because we need to be prepared for 
a virtual instruction, all students virtually instructed quarter one. And so August 31st is when we are starting our school year. Every single student will be um, enrolled in a, in, their virtual, in a virtual learning environment. Every single student will have a complete schedule of classes in Schoology, just like they would have a traditional schedule if they were coming back to school, high school, uh, students will have their six or seven classes, uh, middle school will have their A-B schedule classes, and elementary will have their homeroom and their specials and all those classes defined. Each class has been built in Schoology and each class is aligned to the Maryland State Standards for College and Career Readiness. Each class, once we start each class, will have daily interactive class sessions Monday through Thursday. So this is going to be a break from and different from Edgenuity, where Edgenuity was pretty much the entire thing was self-paced. The kids could work whenever they wanted to work. They could work as far as they wanted to work. They could plow through one course and get it finished before starting another or work through two and leave two off the side. As long as they finish the work at the end of the quarter, that was what satisfied the requirements. This is not like this. This is a daily interactive session, Monday through Thursday, with our teachers. That was one of the major concerns that we heard from parents was that they wanted their children to be able to have that interactive time with their teachers and have that, that social element of instruction. So Schoology affords that Monday through Thursday. Each Friday will be a little bit more like the other system. It will be asynchronous. It will be independent. That will afford us the opportunity to have teachers work professionally to prepare for the next week's lesson, to go through and check progress of students, to go and correct work, and maybe even to do intervention groups with students who are struggling behind and or work with administrators and counselors to reach back to students who are not making progress or who are not, who are not logging on and doing what they need to do online. Um, each class will have multiple graded activities and assessment that will be completed by students within the Schoology platform and that will determine the overall grades. We'll talk a little bit more once we get into the later part of this month to talk about the fact that it is, um, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a much more robust um, grading system and there's a lot more information for parents and students and teachers as we go through this. That's one of the strengths of Schoology and that's why we were moving, in, moving to the platform anyway. Our goal is to phase into face-to-face -face instruction when it is safe to do so, safe for students and safe for staff. So we are going to start virtual online learning, everybody in all the teachers in the building spreading out that learning to each one of the homes. And as we work through September and we manage our data and we look at our, how our students and we look at our engagement, then when we get to October and November, we're going to be talking about if it's safe to do so and in a safe way, bringing in targeted groups of students who desperately need that face-to-face -face instruction and instructional time. And then we will see how that goes. We're going to monitor data. We're going to monitor data. We're going to monitor other systems that have gone through different models. We're going to be gathering all that information through September and through October to make informed decisions. And if all goes well, we are hoping at the end of quarter one to be able to phase into a hybrid instructional model as we originally proposed. And that hybrid model is where students would go two days out of three. They would have two days of direct instruction and three days of independent instruction. We, that, is, that is absolutely the goal and that's where we need to be moving. I know that other school systems have said that they are gonna be out and they are gonna be virtual until January. We aren't going to make that decision until we get everybody assembled and we actually start to work through virtual online learning and understand the challenges and successes of it as well as the data to drive instructional decisions. So completely virtual to start, transitioning to a hybrid classroom instruction, there's going to be parent choice in the middle of that. Parents are going to know exactly what Schoology looks like, exactly what is being offered online, exactly how their children are moving through that product and that platform before they're asked to make a choice. The first quarter, everybody is going to be virtual. If things go well and we look like we're going to be able to transition, then we would be asking parents as to whether or not they would like to have their children attend face-to-face -face instruction. Again. 
it will be predicated on the real-time data, whether or not that offer happens. Parents, I know that other school systems, they've made parents commit to a year of virtual instruction. That is, you, that is not fair. We're going to do it quarter by quarter. And the system that we're building, it will transition. You'll be in the same platform. You'd be covering the same material. The only thing that would be different is you would not have that face-to-face -face instruction two times a day in the hybrid model. So again, the phased-in hybrid schedule that, we, that we're hoping that we're going through is that you know, the very first step one is we, we begin online learning. We begin, we see, we learn our lessons. We're actually in there. We're working as a collaborative group to truly understand the platform, what works well, and where we need to put a little more effort in. During that same time, we're going to be looking at some of our students that really need specialized services and how we can provide those specialized services. The next step will be then bringing in phased groups, starting with kids who are new to school, new to middle school, new to high school, and making sure that we are taking care of our class of 2021. We want to give them, as much as possible, a senior experience. Um, to think that some school systems are saying that they're going to be out for the first semester and perhaps for the entire year, um, that's a devastating decision to a senior who was looking forward to um, their, their, their final year with St. Mary's County Public Schools. Step three is going to be monitor, 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 and add grades until we're all back pre-K through 12. It is an optimistic and hopeful plan, but if we are not optimistic and hopeful, we are not going to provide the very best service that we can for our kids. So I think that a lot of questions are going to be had about you know, virtual school. We've received, since we opened this survey uh, four weeks ago, three weeks ago, we've received about 500 questions. A lot of the questions are very similar, but many go back to they want to know what the Schoology platform looks like. What will virtual instruction look like? What's the structure? What's the feel? How, how interactive is it going to be? Um, so what we figured we'd do is that for the next portion of, of, the, of the town hall, we turn it over to a subject matter expert, and that subject matter expert is Heather Wazakinski, who is an instructional specialist who um, previously, before that, was a media specialist. Now she oversees all the media specialists, but she has a great deal of experience in Schoology itself as she's been coordinating the training for and building a website, an interactive Google site, that ultimately um, will be provided to parents at the conclusion of this presentation. So with this, at this time, I would like to transition it over to somebody who is a subject matter expert, and that would be Miss Heather Wazikinski. Heather. Thank you, Dr. Smith. So as we transition to Schoology, I think one of the important things to recognize is that Schoology is a learning management system. So unlike Imagine Learning and unlike Edgenuity, teachers are going to have control over this platform it's going to allow teachers to embed original content to support instruction. This is a sample screenshot of what a typical Schoology landing page would look like as a student. So every day your student would log in. Our demo student today is Sam, and he would see his courses for the day. This top bar here does stay static throughout the entire um, experience in Schoology. So if he were to click into any of his courses, this static bar would stay here. And in this navigation bar, um, you're going to see four main categories. Those are courses, groups, resources, and grades. So our courses are the classes. So this is going to vary depending on the level of your student. Groups, you will see groups. However, groups aren't populated quite yet. Um, where I see groups coming to play with Schoology, which is actually very exciting, are those after school groups, those experiences that kiddos have outside of the classroom where teachers can take and actually have something outside of um, the educational platform and do something fun outside of the school day. And we have resources, which I'm kind of likening to a mini version of a Google Drive. If a student has files on their own personal computer, they can store them in their resources and have access to that at any time. And then of course we have grades. It is important to note that Schoology is going to become the student's gradebook. And then on the other side, we have some other icons here, which you guys will become very familiar with. The main ones that I'd like to um, talk about today and actually model are the calendar, the mail, the notifications, and then some of the settings that a student has control over within the platform itself. 
I screenshot it just a sample chemistry class. So if a student were to have clicked on their chemistry class, you would see again that this navigation bar remains static. There are going to be some terms that I feel every household in St. Mary's County Public Schools is going to become very familiar with by the end of August. That is the word unit or module, because no matter whether your student is in elementary school, middle school, or high school, we have spent hours making sure that this looks similar so that parents and students have consistency. Under each unit and module, we have what's called a learning set. And again, this word learning set will become common language across the county. And within each learning set, we have three main folders, getting started, learn about and practice it, and show what you know. For our students, your getting started is your introduction to your lesson, kind of like your warm up, your at the bell activity. And then your learn about and practice it, that is the teaching of the lesson that you would typically receive in the classroom. And show what you know is more of a formal or informal assessment to gauge what the student got out of that particular learning set. And then I bumped into an elementary reading class. Um, this actually is part of the learn about and practice it folder so a kiddo would be in here and you can see how the activities are built right into the platform we have students watching something we have them reading and then we have them have them completing and our elementary teachers our elementary supervisors are working so hard to make sure that this experience for our youngest students is easy and um, very easy to navigate so we are going to take a live look um, important to note that student directions, parent access, parent provisioning, that is coming out soon, but we do have a Google site that's up and running. And I do encourage folks to go on to the actual Schoology website itself to get some more tutorials. So with that, we are going to hop into this course. Okay, so now I am Sam. And when Sam logs into school, or into his virtual school, you'll see that all of his courses are showing here. What I like about Schoology is that we do have some tailorization for each student. So if Sam wanted to go into his settings, he could actually make sure that when he logs into Schoology, all of the recent activity that his teachers have posted appears first. So it really is going to be a personal preference. Unfortunately for this demo, it looks like I am the teacher for all of these classes, but in a real setting, you would see different teachers' pictures and profiles. So Sam could go in and see that his media teacher has posted this really fun Bitmoji where you know, he can click on this. And this is courtesy of Fran Brooks at Green Holly. So Fran Brooks went and made this cute little Bitmoji, and Sam can now go and interact right within the platform to go outside to other websites, which is fun and it's really easy for our younger students to do this. I could also go down and see that some teachers have posted updates. I can see that this teacher for this ELA class posted an update about his summer and a little picture of his vacation. So this would be a nice place for kids to start their morning. Now, once we're in the course, and Sam is unique because Sam is enrolled across many, many courses across different grade levels, but let's just say that Sam is in this high school digital media. He's in the course. And again, we have our static course navigation. So students will see this throughout their experience. So if they need to bump out to go to a different course, it's really easy to navigate. I can see that in this course build, which is being built out by our art teachers, they have a unit zero. So they even built in a welcome to school unit. I can see they have learning sets and students can easily navigate through that. And then their first unit begins. Again, these words that we are all going to know and love, learning set. And these three main folders are right here for students. What I also love about Schoology is that the navigation is really easy for all students. Right now, students can see they can only go back because they haven't gone anywhere yet in the platform. They would actually have to get into this learning set now from here, it really is following this breadcrumb trail. I click to my next activity. What is digital art? It opens up the activity. And in this instance, we're going out to a website to explore digital art. And then we're reviewing slides about facts and entering some work. So again, navigation, super easy. And again, we'll look the same no matter if you have a five-year-old or an 18-year-old. So we go back out to courses, 
we're going to pop into a chemistry class. I kept two units up, and I kept lots of learning sets up here. A teacher would be unpublishing anything that they don't want your student to see or work ahead on. So if learning sets two through seven were not happening this week, a teacher has the access to go in and unpublish that. And that is a great feature because we don't want students to get too worried about what's coming ahead. We want them to stay right where we want them to be just like they were in a actual physical classroom space. But I did want to point out that we have this built out for weeks and weeks ahead of time so that we're ready to go for when students come back. And then we pop into a chemistry class and again, similar naming structure. Pop back out to courses and I will sample, let's go into geometry. In this course, I did hide all the other units, so right now, Sam would go in and just see unit one. As far as Sam knowing what he has to do in geometry in unit one, that's gonna come from our teachers. This is where the synchronous part of this experience is going to be. They'll be posting updates and what they have to do on a weekly basis, a daily basis. So today, Sam would have to go into unit one. There's two learning sets, so perhaps this teacher wants them to finish two learning sets in one day. And here are our activities. I don't want to, I can spend hours and hours talking about Schoology, but I wanted to point this out in particular because you can see there's so many different types of activities. In this first activity, there's directions to look at these figures and then comment and make notes about which ones are the same, which ones are different, and share in a discussion. So here's a piece here where they're interacting with their classmates and their teachers. This is built out to now automatically start an attempt at a spiral review. Once a student is here, it is interactive, which means that when they start the attempt on this, and I will not answer questions because it's been a while since I've been in geometry, I can see here that we have multiple choice, fill in the blank, and this is all going to go back to the teacher. The student will have a chance to review that before they even finish it. Schoology right now is letting me know that I have unattempted answers because I didn't answer those. So as a student, I want to go back and flag these and finish these. And then I would submit it. Depending on how an assignment is set up in Schoology, most of these are going to be graded and the student will have immediate feedback, but there will be some that especially those writing assignments where a teacher is going to review and then provide feedback and that will all populate within their gradebook. And one thing you are going to notice this time around after, you know, we went through our continuity of learning is that you're going to see those courses such as media and art and those electives. So a student who has media two days a week would actually have a media course just as if they were in, whoops, timed out. Just as if they were actually in their media class. So again, this goes back to Ms. Brooks's Bitmoji classroom, the first units on digital citizenship. And so courses such as media, where we typically meet face to face and we're really using print books, we've really taken time to make sure that we are meeting the digital need now. And lastly, you know, if we're back at this view, again, everything's static, everything stays the same. Sam can come over here now to his dashboard. And what I think most teachers and staff members working on Schoology love is the fact that we have this calendar here. And parents, you will have access to this calendar as well. So you'll be able to link all of your students. You'll be able to link their calendars for their courses. So I could log in as a parent today and realize that Sam was supposed to turn something in on July 7th and he just didn't quite get to it. So I would see that we have some overdue projects and we also have some things that are upcoming. If Sam just forgot to do this spiral, re spiral review that I just logged out of, he can click right from here without actually having to go back into the course. And another feature is that when he goes to his calendar, he can put personal things on his calendar just like we would in a Google calendar. So I added something earlier. He added that he had to finish his ELA essay on the third. 
So as students start to navigate this platform, I think that this is gonna be so user-friendly that once they get used to it, they're gonna be able to go in and use this as their personal calendar to really keep them organized. In fact, every day they can actually go in and set times to do things if they know they wanna work on ELA at a certain time or if they've requested to have a Google Meet with a teacher to talk about something that they're having um, a struggle with, they can put it on their calendar this way. And then notifications pop up here. So there's many ways to communicate and many ways to navigate the platform. And I keep saying lastly, but this really is my last thing. Course dashboard, we have a calendar. If Sam wants to log in every day, and again, see this recent activity, Sam can go in and he has some options for settings. So students have some places to go to personalize the course. So that's just a quick overview of what the platform looks like in a nutshell. Well, uh, you know, certainly thank you very much, Ms. Wasikinski, and, and you're representing the work of a multitude of supervisors and then the supervisors coordinated with lead content teachers for each one of the courses and then they assembled teams that have been building out their resources to have all of this information look and feel and the goal is to have the entire minimally the entire first marking period pretty much laid out with units modules and learning sets all built out with all of those component pieces so you really have an idea of the robust amount of work that that's going to be available for students through this platform um, does this platform scale to a uh, mobile device yes so there is a Schoology um, app that you would download to a smartphone yep and on that Google site that we've created there is, um, I actually, now there is a page for the app. So if a parent wants to get a head start and get that downloaded, they can do that now. Of course, we have to wait for our logins and passwords, but just to get a step ahead of the game, I do recommend getting that app on the device. Yeah, I've been, so for those uh, um, within the system, we have been using it not necessarily we built some courses to educate ourselves so there's a course that has been built to educate teachers on how schoology works and that's a lovely course that really helps a great deal there's been one for administrators to help administrators understand how teachers are building out the course there's been one for a central office with the division of instruction a group where we've done resources and, and things such as that so we've been using the platform um, and I will tell you, the mobile device and the mobility of that is, is really um, a great benefit. That's one of the things that drew us to this platform before we were ever, considering it for a learning management system, before we ever got into the COVID and, and the pandemic and things such as this. Um, so uh, thank you very much for the overview. Um, is there anything else that you would like to share before we move on to questions? I think that's it. Okay. Um, I, we just want to, again, I want to thank everybody who, is, who has worked on this. We we purchased the program and and turned it on in march late march early april and pretty much staff has built all of this since then and we've learned lessons from other systems that have the schoology platform but once you turn on the schoology platform all it really is is it's just it's a it's a blank slate you can build and do and see however you whatever you want to do with it our content supervisors felt very strongly and we completely agree that we want to make sure that it is consistent across all of the different courses so that a student would have a similar look and feel as they toggle between one class to the next and parents would have a similar look and feel if they toggle between students in elementary middle and high because we do recognize that when we say you're going to be learning virtually a great deal of responsibility then falls upon the, the, the a parent to be the facilitator of that learning. And that was certainly one of the things that we heard over and over again as we were reviewing the spring rollout of Edgenuity was um, how, how important it was to make sure that we were considering the parent who's trying to facilitate this learning at home. The other part is the multimodal part of it. It works on a smartphone, a tablet, a laptop. A laptop is the very best for having the largest screen and being able to interact and do keyboarding and such like that to, to access it. So 
We do have resources. The Google site that has been set up with a great many very informative videos that we have created in-house, and a lot of them are narrated by Mrs. Mrs. Wazikinski, and she does a wonderful job, as well as the Schoology, uh, the Schoology site itself to kind of give you an overview of the, of the product. Um, we have so much work ahead of us. August is going to be an exceptionally busy and bumpy month. We are going to have to get from you parents, every single one of you, we're going to need to know what your situation is at home. We are sending out a letter later today or first thing tomorrow morning. We're going to consult. I, I don't know what the, what, the, um, what the governor may have said at his press briefing today at 3.30. So we're going to have to review what the governor said and then take a look at the letter we were planning on sending out to make sure that what we are sharing aligns with what the governor has shared in his press conference. So you may not get the letter until tomorrow morning. That letter will have multiple links to things that were referenced today, um, as well as a survey for each parent to complete for each child they have in their home where you're going to give us information as far as does your child have access to a laptop, a tablet, or a Chromebook, um, and do you have internet access in your home? Because these are going to be the two incredibly important component parts of being able to fully support virtual learning in your individual home. We have about, I think the report that I got this morning from Dr. Walker, we have six or 7,000 laptops that are ready to be distributed. So they will be distributed in the month of August and they will go to children first and parents and households who identify that they do not have a computer or a device for an individual student will make sure that there is a device provided for them. And then later in September, late August and September, we're anticipating a delivery of about another 7,500 to 8,000 laptops that will be then distributed out to households so that we get to basically a one-to-one -one device out across the school system. For our littlest learners, our Head Start pre-K programs, we've um, been ordering iPads and cases so that they're able to use that to, um, to interact with the online learning environment that we, that we have. That survey is going to be incredibly important and the information that you give on that survey is going to go right back to the individual school principals so that when they get all their staff back in in august they're going to be able to schedule times for you to come in to pick up instructional materials as well as computer and technology needs the good news is that the county commissioners put out a press release i think yesterday talking about their investment of three and a half million dollars to expand broadband out to um, all parts of the county. We provided information to them about our households that did not have internet access and I believe that they incorporated that into the plan. So for those of you who don't have internet access, know that the county commissioners have committed three and a half million dollars of the COVID relief funds to aid in that connectivity. So we are very hopeful for that in particular, not only for our students, but also for staff who are in underserved parts of the county for internet access. I'll look to them for more information as, the, as that progresses forward. Um, there have been a lot of questions that have been submitted about what the schedule will look like, and you've been given kind of a preview of what the platform and the courses will look like. The learning schedule and again, here's the two terms you've heard over and over again, and we're going to keep on using them. And I know that people are going to be, that's very jargony and confusing, but there really isn't a better term for it. Asynchronous means that a, a child can work independent and there isn't a direct interaction back and forth with anybody in the school system. Synchronous, which means we're going to be conversing at the same time. Somebody is going to be on the laptop, on the computer at the same time your child's on the computer, and there's going to be some kind of back and forth, either through video conferencing or through um, updating a message board or by responding to email in real time. That is synchronous. What we are planning with the Schoology platform is that Monday through Thursday would be synchronous which means that teachers will be following a schedule similar to as if the children were coming to school, entering the classroom, sitting down, and going through instruction. 
Now this is the art of a teacher. It will not be the same every single day. Each teacher understands the content that their children are to be covering that day, week, and month, and they're going to be interacting with students. Maybe they might be doing a direct lesson that takes 20 minutes where they are directly going through content. It might just be a 30-minute check-in. It could be a larger conversation where they're gathering people together. It could be, hey, I've uploaded videos for you to watch tomorrow and the next day, and we will be getting together to discuss it on the third. That's the art of teacher, and that's the flexibility and autonomy that the Schoology platform affords. But Monday through Thursday, teachers will be following a very traditional beginning of the day, end of the day, classes meet throughout schedule. And why we're doing that is because teachers deserve normalcy just like we all do. And in the middle of the pandemic, we had teachers who were working all hours and responding to emails and, to, and doing things back and forth late into the night, early in the morning, in the middle of the night. And we were having people peppering questions back and forth. It won't be like that. We're going to get back to a regular schedule where Monday through Thursday, from the start of school to the close of school, that's the interactive session that we'd be available for and the synchronous instruction that takes place in schools. On Friday, that's where we go to a, a more independent model, and that's a little less, that's asynchronous, where children are going to work independently on assigned materials, and teachers will be able then to use that time to collaborate with one another, to build lessons for the next week, specific parts of it, to maybe record videos, to review student work, to refer students back to administrators or counselors or support staff at the building if they're not engaging across the platform, things such as that. But that's the way that schedule is going to look. And we all have to have that in our heads when we move forward because I think ingenuity um, really kind of confuses how we're going to be opening in the fall. So uh, this has been our third town hall meeting. I hope that uh, we have presented material that have answered a lot of the questions that have been posted. Please know that we've, we've received over 500 questions over the last several weeks, and we take each one of those questions and we've put it back to the individual groups that are doing the work, and then we've built those questions and responses into the next town hall meeting. And in fact, we, have a, we don't have anything next week. But the week after that, we have the Board of Ed meeting. The Board of Ed meeting will have a great deal of information about the opening of school and what that looks like. And we will be incorporating all of the questions that have been posted um, over the last two days. Um, as well as then, because the town hall seems to be a heavily viewed item, we will then have another town hall following that Board of Ed meeting right before we open schools where we can answer questions. And all things being equal and the way we're moving forward, that town hall may very well be face to face and that I think we're going to have to start transitioning into an opportunity for people to come and ask their questions directly. In fact, I've heard from the board that the next board meeting, we're going to be opening it, social distancing and doing all the things that need to be had so that people can come and provide, if they want to come and make public comment, they would be able to safely do so. So with that, we have a bit of time left. Dr. Montgomery, I know that you've been kind of going through all the questions, and we know the questions that were asked ahead of time, but are there particular questions that, that you think haven't been, topics that haven't been necessarily addressed in our presentations or things we'd like to bring out? are a few. Um, I, can ever, I assume everybody can hear me well. Uh, the first one that I thought uh, people would want to have information about are if we are, go go when we return to school, are we going to have an open house? Are we going to start with an open house? You know, that's a really, that, that is an excellent question. And I know, because I, I popped into your Zoom meetings that you were having today with your principals, and that was one of the topic of conversations, because that's what principals usually talk about as we get ready to transition in August. What were, they, what were some of their responses? So next week, we, next week we have our uh, administrative meetings that's kicking off the new school year that we have every year, and we're doing them virtually. And um, we're going to have uh, a work group, um, people that are going to get together, a group of principals that are going to get together and talk about about what open house options could be. Some of the things that they were kicking around today were to have you know, a virtual open house that they would be bringing kids in and do it by grade level and even do it by teaching team or by class, however they would work that out. Um, some of them were talking about trying to pair 
uh, the technology distribution, and we have to get textbooks and materials and consumables to kids as well, and sometimes you know, create some type of schedule like we did at the end of the school year where kids had to come in to pick up their materials, but we would do a, create a schedule where families and kids could come and we would figure out the social distancing pieces and wearing masks and all of the safety precautions but get kids in to uh, go through some type of experience for open house. So we're, in, we're going to plan something, and what that's gonna look like will depend on what kind of ideas they come up with. Yeah, and, and they're, they're gonna come up with incredible ideas. The one thing that I do know is that the, the people that, that we have working on behalf of our students are, are, the, are, the, are, the, are, the, are just the very best. They are so passionate about the work. They are so creative about finding opportunities to make a meaningful connection with students and also as we're drawing in parents with parents. I went to several of the end of the year distributions and, and um, some of them were, you know, were very tearful and heartfelt because we were concluding a year, but others where there was lighthearted, there was a bit of levity. Uh, Great Mills High School in particular with Dr. Heibel, they, you know, they, they really enjoyed that, that interaction that they had with their students and I think there's gonna be a goal to kind of recreate all of that. So at that, so as we get into August, what you're gonna see is a transition away from the superintendent talking in virtual town halls to the actual principals talking to parents and to students about how their individual schools are then going to be taking all of the guidance that they provided and all the things that are going on and how they're going to make it their very own and make a meaningful connection with you and your child. Very good. Very good. Um, the next question is, but you, you did answer it, but just to reiterate is our children do not have the proper tablets or laptops to successfully navigate online learning. Will there be any provision of these items by SMCPS? And if so, how can a parent sign up to have these provided? Yeah, and, and really that's gonna be coordinated by the survey that you send back. And if you identify that you don't have a device available for your child, you're gonna be at the top of the list for distribution of materials and then they'll be working out a schedule for each school to be able to do that. Please know that we have ordered enough machines that when they are delivered, we should be very close to one to one for every single student. And after that, we will then be ordering even additional machines because we will have depopulated the schools, the school buildings themselves. We will have distributed every laptop that we have available. Um, next question, STEM specific. How will STEM be addressed with the virtual Schoology platform? Okay, and, and, and that, a little bit of that was kind of, Ms. Wazikinski kind of referred to it. The teachers are building course specific Schoology courses. So, um, I, did you have, you, you've had a conversation with some of the STEM specific schools and STEM specific teachers? We have, yes. And so, um, they are ju just as we would have fifth grade math, we're going to have fifth grade math STEM. So, all of the STEM teachers have been building content in their courses as well. So, there'll be STEM specific courses built. Yeah, excellent. And again, the, the caliber of people creating the courses is, is just really incredible. What else? If we choose to homeschool, can sports and other extracurricular activities like orchestra still be available to our students? Okay. Um, the term there that I think we want to touch on is um, homeschool. So homeschool means that you are completely responsible for the instruction of your children and you have no interaction with the school system other than to inform us that you're homeschooling your child and then there's a one there's an there's a check-in I think at the beginning and the end of the year um, I strongly encourage everybody to to not homeschool instead make sure that you enroll in St. Mary's County Public Schools and you would then be enrolled in the virtual school where you have a robust online program that we will be we will make available to parents all year long if you so choose to have your child virtually taught and not step foot in a st mary's county public school for the entire year that 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 opportunity that option will be afforded to you if you are having your child virtually instructed um, that wouldn't exclude you from uh, opportunities that we have within the school system or within extracurriculars. I will tell you that extracurricular activities and athletics, I wonder if there's a question about that. It's, it's the same question. Okay. Same answer. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, there are all kinds of questions about athletics. And uh, we all fall under the umbrella of the MPSSAA, the Maryland Public Schools Secondary, Ad Secondary Schools Athletic Administration. 
that governs uh, when seasons start, when seasons end, that govern play, that govern the competition between counties, that then structure all that out. That is the MPSSAA. Now, I know that that question was asked of Dr. Salmon last week, and we didn't get a really definitive answer. The public school superintendents are asking for a much more definitive answer because the one thing we don't want to do is move quickly in one direction and then in some way limit a child's op opportunity. So, for example, if we ran a county created football schedule and then the state decided to allow football to run later in the year, we might invalidate our opportunity for our kids to play because we brought them in and had them practicing and playing. Right now, nobody is to start sports specific um, training until August. 12th, I believe. I think it's the 12th. I believe so. So, right now, we do have students who are in athletic conditioning where they are exercising and building up strength and stamina and bending and all of that, but it is not sports specific because the MPSSA tells us that if you introduce a sports specific item during the, before then, you might invalidate the entire season for your players. So, um, we are going, this is one of those ones where we are going to look to the governing bodies that oversee this and follow their direction. And I know that that is maddening for all of our parents of student athletes because we are getting so close to that start date on the 12th. Um, please know that we are pushing for them to provide the guidance that they so desperately need to provide for each LEA. It can't be each LEA's decision uh, and then consider, and then have it considered state competitions. So. Okay. Um, will MCAP be waived for the upcoming school year? Okay. Hey, we're at 502. We're a little over. And this, this is a great question to end on because it's, I don't, I don't know. I, MCAP got waived last year, so nobody took the test, which means we don't have any of the data, which means we don't have any of the performance data that drives the Maryland School Report Card, which means we don't have all the data that sets the teacher student learning objectives and the goals for this year. We are in this data desert right now, and I don't know how the state is going to then put forth a testing plan for this year, but that's completely the state's responsibility, and the Maryland State Department of Education will inform us of their decision when they make it. So for those of you who have been with us and stayed with us for an hour, thank you very much for your attention. Please know that we work every single day on behalf of your children, and that is, that's, that's, what, that's what governs our work. Um, I personally am looking forward to uh, getting back to a little sense of normalcy, of getting people back to, to come and solve the incredible, the incredible challenges that we have before us. I will tell you that you, we have an incredible creative group of people who I can't believe the solutions that they've come up with for some problems that seem to defy, defy, a, a, defy a solution. Um, we're going to be uh, better for all of our work. I know that when we come together um, at the other side of this, we will have many, many lessons learned. Um, and I look forward to uh, talking uh, with the board um, and presenting on the 12th. Um, for those of you uh, who are so inclined, the letter that once you receive, you will also then get a, a, a link to the school system website where you will see our entire recovery plan posted there in a narrative form as well as all of the PowerPoint presentations. It tracks with the Maryland State Department of Education's 13 criteria for a recovery plan. Um, again, thank you for your attention, and I look forward to seeing you all really soon.